Welcome back to the channel. This is my third video back and the third in my new series where I show off each of my lanterns. As you can see in the background, I've got a fair number to get through. Today it is this very rare Fosco P350 forward slash four. The forward slash four is a debatable part of its code and I'll get to why that is a little bit later when I disassemble it. This thing is about 80 centimeters tall so I can't actually fit it in frame if I have the camera down here. So you are going to have to be positioned up there, at least until I've disassembled it. So these lanterns are incredibly rare nowadays. Um, they were used quite a lot in Bournemouth. These were in Bournemouth long before Street View was really a thing. So there are two of these visible on Street View, but one of them is missing the bowl and canopy. And I'll get to why that is in a minute, because they have a huge design flaw. It's going to be harder to work on because it's not fastened to a column, so it's going to be moving all over the place. There was a larger P355, which was a lot taller and a lot wider as well. Similar size to the P109, I think. There is one of those over there. So as you may notice, it's a very similar design to the P111, which is actually over there on the windowsill. That one's got an LED lamp in it for now, until I can get a suitable gear for it. It's a very sort of similar design, but you may notice one major difference is the base. It's a lot deeper. The gear is situated in there as well, meaning it's very base heavy. The top does not hold much weight to it. And this is spun aluminium, so it's got nothing to it either. To open this, you may be wondering, um, how do you open it? What's the design flaw that causes them to lose this upper part? You may notice rivets around the base and up here as well. That is because the bowl the canopy, the crown, and indeed the acorn as well, the finial, is all one unit. You have to twist it anti-clockwise, like so, and then you lift the canopy up. You can see the photocell wires hanging out there. And here's your structure of the lantern. The design flaw with these is that these are the two nuts that hold on the canopy bowl and also finial. The only thing keeping it on there is a twist mechanism and hopes and prayers. So, this particular example dates to 1987. Inside is a, what remains of a mini cell. It's been ripped to bits. When I got it, it was in pieces at the bottom. There's bits of like wire heat protector all around the place. It was a mess. It does also look like there's a part missing there. You may be wondering about this finial. That can come off, but you need to do so via a bolt in the side of there. You can see the top of the mini cell there, which you'll get a closer look at in a bit. So now you've had a good look at this, let's bring you down here so we can have a closer look at this. Now you can sort of see the layout of the base. This one's got a base down lamp. So the end of the lamp is actually pointing upwards. The Fosco over there has a base up lamp. There's a lot of corrosion in this one. The outside paint is mostly all right. Now, if you know anything about lanterns, you may know that two of these is not gonna hold the bowl and canopy on. The wind would catch the canopy, it would twist it, it would unlock itself, and the canopy and bowl would go flying off or be knocked off or any number of things like that. And considering there's really no weight to this, the wind would just catch it and take it off. Again, in old Bournemouth photos, a few of these can be seen, and um, I have spotted a few with missing canopies, as well as the one on Street View, which was there until, I think, about 2014, when its column was removed. And there's also one visible on Street View. However, I haven't been to Bournemouth yet, so I don't know if it's still there, although I do plan to visit. Now, this example has got some corrosion here and there, but I don't think it's been used very much. The gear is in really good condition, at least on the other side of this. We can take out the 125 watt um, mercury lamp. This is actually an Edison screw cap mercury lamp. It was brand new in its box. That's the box for it there. Venture. Let's put it in its box to avoid anything happening to it while I'm fiddling around on this desk. Because I have knocked off lamps before and they have broke. This component here is the capacitor. It's an RIC capacitor. It's held in by a little toggle there, which is actually really loose. I'm going to tighten that on. There we go. Lovely. So the capacitor is an RIC capacitor, 10 microfarad, and it's got a date code there of 287. In the context of capacitors, that likely means the second week of 1987, not February. That will be early to mid January of 1987. 
just clips in like that again. Before we open it, there is one more interesting thing on this side of the gear tray. You can see there the sticker, Fosco Limited, where United Kingdom. And then you can see it's handwritten from this point on, apart from the IP23. So it says P350, 240 volts, 125 watt MBF. So 240 volts being the input voltage to the fixture, 125 watt MBF being the lamp type it was designed to run. Now, interestingly, you could get 125 watt three pin bayonet cap uh, mercury examples, which were sold as the P350 forward slash three. You could also get the P350 forward slash five, but there was no mention of a P350 with an Edison screw cap for 125 watt mercury. I have two theories. There is a missing P350 forward slash four in the catalogs that I could find. It could be that variant, the missing one. So it would actually fill a place in the catalogs that we didn't previously know about. It could also be that Edison screw cap was available upon request. An even more unlikely possibility is that this lamp holder is not original. So the means of attaching the lantern to the column are as follows. There is an octagonal spigot, which would sit on the column. There are four grub screws located around each side. Notice I've managed to fit the cable through because the grub screws are quite large. I managed to get the cable through there and into the lantern so I can actually stand it on its own. So to access the gear on this example, you can see a screw there and a screw there. This lantern seems to be going with the theme that you have to twist things and pull them up to um, alleviate them of their position. So it's just a regular Phillips flathead screwdriver in here to unscrew them. You don't need to unscrew them all the way, you just need to loosen them. I will say that none of the screws are seized in this example. Every single one of them turns. So you just twist this and lift it up and out it comes. It is still connected to the base via this, but this is just a two part clip connector. So it will just unclip like that. Another reason I suspect this wasn't run very much is because this isn't brittle. Usually um, with lanterns, the connectors go a bit crispy after a while because they've been exposed to heat with their lamps and also their gear, essentially. That's what's in your base, just a simple mains in, and then you've got your two part connector to connect it to the rest of the lantern and the gear tray. You can see the old connector there. Um, I tell a lie when I said um, none of the screws were seized. That one is there, but that's it. And I think with some good persuasion that would come out, but I didn't feel the need to do that. So it's a very simple layout in the base. And now we're down to the main, the most important bit arguably of the lantern, the gear tray. Now I've already had a look at the top, so let's have a look at the bottom. As you can see, that is in great condition. Another reason I suspect this wasn't run very much. You can read everything on there. It looks virtually brand new. There's some dirt on it, but that's it. It was made by Palmar. It's a choke for one 125 watt high pressure mercury vapor lamp. 240 volts, which is the input. It operates at a frequency of 50 Hertz. And the cap number for this example is MA125. Presumably MA means mercury. 125 is the wattage of mercury lamp this is for. The terminals are here. You've also got your designated terminal for the earth connection. But arguably the most important part of this um, choke is the C87 printed on top. 87 refers to the year, so 1987. Um, you've also got C, which refers to a month of the year. This one is graded C, so March. We can reasonably assume that the lantern is also from around that time. More evidence of this is the mini cell is dated to 1989, and its date is May of 1989. So it's considerably newer than the rest of the lantern. Whether this was installed at a later date or was indeed put in the Fosco at its manufacture and sold with it, it's currently unknown. But it has been disconnected because of the state of it. I don't, it probably works, but I don't really trust it, so to speak. But this mini cell does come out. So the mini cell is very unusual. I don't know if I've got it put together correctly, because it was in pieces when I first got the lantern. This is a closer look at it. White is live out, brown is live in, and blue is obviously neutral. Then it looks like there may be some kind of part missing from this. And then the wires, 
that are presumably supposed to connect up to this detector are really long. I don't know exactly who makes this. There is a plaque or whatever you want to call that in there, which says Diamond N Controls. You can see it's stamped to May and there's the year, 1989. It was disconnected when I got it and it was also in pieces in the bottom of the lantern underneath there. And then this was just installed in the top. If you recognize this photo cell or who makes it or what type it is, please do let me know because I have had a look, but I can't seem to find one that matches. So if you do recognize that, leave a comment below and um, you will be accredited on the P350's webpage. Now we've got to put this back together that we've had a look at it and get it ready to warm up. Right, so let's put the cell on first. So that's the canopy and hat put back together. Now we can reassemble the base. It's a very simple reassembly. I'm just gonna chuck this mini cell into the base, like so, just out of sight, out of mind, along with all the bits of rubbish that came with it. So now that that's all in there, granted if you have one of these lanterns, I don't think you're gonna to need to do this because um, let's hope yours is in a bit of better condition than mine. It's not in bad condition, it's just, you know, for something from the 80s, it, you can't really fault it. You just drop the gear tray and uh, lamp holder back in, and then you twist it anti-clockwise, and then you just tighten it straight back on. Then you have to connect up the two-part connector again. We'll install the lamp now as well, so I don't put the canopy on and forget, because I don't really want to have to take it off and put it back on again. So you put the canopy on. I'm actually gonna put you up there for this. So you pop the canopy back on. There is no kind of markings on the outside to let you know if you've lined it up. So you've just gotta look and guess. And clearly I've not got it right. And then you're supposed to turn it clockwise to get it to lock back in place. I don't know if this is locked in place. No, nope. no, it's not locked in place. And now, now I can't get it back on either. Right, it's on. Hold it this way maybe and pull, twist it. Oh, it was locked and I've just unlocked it again. Right, that seemed to be the tactic. Hold it up here and do it. In case you're wondering why I changed my hoodie, I spilled tea all down it. It's not my day today. Let's just get this over with. Um, I've been brainstorming and I've got an idea how I might be able to close it. So the idea is to lift it, shimmy it, on and I think I've done it. I have indeed done it. Let's test if that was just a fluke or well, that's an actual way to do things. I think I've done it again. Yeah, so to close one of these things, that seems to be the best way. Hold it by the top finial, um, lift it up slightly and jiggle it and turn it clockwise and it might lock into place. It saves me just grabbing the base and trying to lift it and turn it from here, because that's what I was doing. I was holding the base in place so it wouldn't turn. Again, on a column, that wouldn't be a problem. Um, you'd just have to hold this and lift this up. But then I was trying to lift this up and turn it at the same time with one hand. And now, with the P350 back together, back in one piece, back into a more recognisable form, it's time for a warm-up.
Right, that's just about reaching full warm up now. So let's see if we can actually get a cool down. You can kind of see it there. So that was the Fosco P350 forward slash four. Tear down and warm up. I hope you all enjoyed. The next video I post will be on a Philips MA60 gear and head. So stay tuned.